Hello and welcome to the second video lecture on legal, ethical, cultural and environmental concerns. And this time we're going to look at open source and proprietary software. So without further ado, let's take a look at source code. So what do we mean by source code? Well, let's take a look. So over here, we've got my friend Bob. Bob is a programmer and he's currently working on Super Word Processor version 4. He could be writing this in C++ or Java or Python or C Sharp or any other computer programming language. And he's creating what we call source code here in the programming language. And this is what we call human readable. That means a regular person, a human, can read it and understand it to some extent. Obviously, if you're not a great programmer, it's going to look very complicated. But even if you don't know a lot about programming, you could look at this example and think, hmm, this is something to do with colors and switching and changing colors. So again, a regular person can look at this, understand it, and if they've got some programming experience, they can make changes, edit it, improve it, etc. However, this is not computer readable. When Bob is finished, oh, don't have to worry about my viruses just now. When Bob is finished, he needs to change it into a form that is computer readable. So he's going to translate it. So depending on the language, this could be compiled or interpreted or even assembled. And he's going to get the release code. This is Super Word Processor 4, and now you can go to a shop and buy it on DVD, or you can download it and install it on your computer. And this is made up of ones and zeros. It's binary, and now it's only readable by computers. So if you were to try and open this and have a look at the code, rather than just running the software, you'd get something like this. You'd get binary. Now, actually, when we represent binary, on screen for people, we usually represent it using hexadecimal. That's why you can see some different numbers and letters here, not just ones and zeros, but this is just how we represent the binary file. So you can see this makes absolutely no sense. You can't tell what's going on here. With this over here, yeah, you can kind of understand it, can't you? You can kind of look at this and go, yeah, I can understand some of this. But with this, what the what is this i don't understand it it's very difficult to go from this form back to here for anything more than a very simple program it's next to impossible it takes such a long time to kind of reverse engineer it so essentially the this file the binary file is only readable by computers so your computer understands it you don't unlike the source code which humans can read and understand and modify much more easily so now we know what source code is, let's compare proprietary and open source software. So much of the software we buy is written by organizations who are trying to make a profit. They want to make money. I understand that. I'm a teacher. I teach for my job and I get paid for it. And I'd like to keep getting paid for it. So we call this sort of software proprietary or closed source software. The source code is kept secure and versions of the software are distributed as executable programs, just like I described in the previous slide. The user is not able to access the source code and cannot modify it. The source code is kept by the programmer, it's kept by the software development company. They only give out the release code, which can run on the computer, but is not human readable. Copyright laws also forbid this modification. So we looked at that a little in the previous video lesson. And again, it's protected by copyright. You're not allowed to change or edit proprietary software. In return for the money paid, these organizations fully test the product. Well, hopefully and regularly provide upgrades to fix bugs or improve the features of their program. If the product has faults in it, then the user can contact the organization for an upgrade or fix. So this is 
slightly idealized. Not every company provides the correct level of support, but the basic idea is with proprietary software, you're paying money for it and you should get support and help if something goes wrong. These products, that is proprietary or closed source software, usually has a significant amount of online support available for them. So if you go to the company website, you're going to have lots of documentation. You're going to have maybe uh, you can have forums where you can help. There'll be professionals there to help you. You might have chat available to talk about the problems, things like that. Microsoft is perhaps the most well-known producer of proprietary software worldwide. That's why they make a lot of money, billions and billions and billions per year. So let's take a look at some more examples of proprietary or closed source software. So again, Microsoft Windows or Mac OS. These are closed source software. You can run them, but you can't look under the hood and see what's happening. Again, a lot of the big famous application software that you'll use, Microsoft Office, Adobe Photoshop, most games, Angry Birds, etc., etc. These are all going to be proprietary software. Let's contrast that now with open source software. Software developed under open standard has its source code freely available so others can access it and make changes to it. So as well as downloading the release code and running it on your computer, you can also download and look at the source code. Now, why would you want the source code? Well, you can change it so you can fix any errors or bugs, or you can pay somebody else to do it for you. You can add extra features. If there's something the software doesn't do and you know how to use it, you, you're, you know, you've got some programming experience, you've got some knowledge, you can add that feature. You can also make your own version of the software, upload it to the internet, and let other people download your new and improved version. So open source software is sometimes called free software. But we have to be a little bit careful here. This is free as in free speech, not a free lunch. However, most open source software can be downloaded for the cost of zero pounds, zero, zero pence. It doesn't always have to be free. Sometimes it is charged for. Often companies might have the software available for free, but they might charge big businesses for technical support. And that way they can still make a profit and still bring a lot of revenue. But generally, most open source software is free as in free cost. Open source software is often regularly updated by a community of developers. These updated versions are then made available to anyone again for little or usually no cost. Despite being free, this software is often of very high quality because of the community of highly skilled developers who regularly test, fix and improve the product. A lot of the people who work on this open source software are professional software developers. These are very highly skilled programmers who are giving up their time to develop this software. It's a hobby, it's an interest, it's a passion of theirs. So don't think that open source software is going to be of less good quality in terms of the coding. Some very wonderful, very highly professional pieces of software are open source. And again, anybody can contribute. So you have a huge team of people giving up their time to fix it, edit any bugs, improve it and add new features. On the downside, with open source software, there's no one to blame if something goes wrong. So basically, there's nobody to sue if the software doesn't work and it crashes and it doesn't work with other software and it causes problems. That's not so much of a problem for an individual, but for a big business, that could be more of a problem. So a popular form of open source software is what we call GNU slash Linux, uh, often just referred to as Linux. You might recognize versions such as Ubuntu or Mint. There are lots of different forks of Linux because it is open source. People can download this operating system source code, edit it, change it, make their own versions. 
Another version you've probably heard of is Android. Android is sort of Google's version of Linux modified for mobile devices. As with any open source software, you can actually go on to the Google website and you can actually download the source code for Android if you wanted to. You've also got a lot of software products like OpenOffice or the web browser Firefox. Again, these are open source software applications. You can download the release code and run it just as you would any software. But if you're interested, you could download the open source uh, source code and then play around with it or take a look at it. And that way, maybe you can make edits to it or change it or just make yourself feel secure that the software works the way that it's intended. Let's just finish by looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages, comparing and contrasting these two different models. So open source software, you get the source code. Proprietary software, you don't. Open source software is usually free of charge. With proprietary software, you almost always have to pay something to gain access to the software. With open source software, because you have the source code, you can modify it, change it, redistribute it, Proprietary software, you can't. You're not allowed to modify the software, and if you did, it would normally, in most countries, be illegal, and you could be charged and get sent to prison. Open source software can be installed on as many computers as necessary. You can download the software, copy it, put it on lots of different computer systems, no problems. Proprietary software, you have to pay for each computer it runs on. Usually, you can download or buy the software and it'll run on one computer or a small number of computers but after that you have to pay for extra licenses. Again this is more of an issue for big businesses who might need thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies of a software to run on lots of different computers. They can't just buy one and copy it onto different computers they could get into a lot of trouble so they need to contact the company and make sure they have enough licenses to run it on every machine. With open source software, no one person is responsible for problems with the software. However, with proprietary software, you should get full support from the software developer. Again, in theory. With open source software, you usually only get community support. So again, these are volunteers. People are setting up websites, providing documentation in their free time, running forums to help people with the software. Hopefully with proprietary software, you're going to get commercial support as well as community support. Hopefully the proprietary software company, somebody like Microsoft will have a website full of documentation and lots of help that is professionally provided to make sure that it works and that you can run it the way that you want. Again, these are kind of theoretical ideas. It's not always as simple as black and white. One works one way, one works the other. But these are kind of good points to use in the GCSE exam so you can compare and contrast them simply and get lots of marks. Okay, I'm going to draw this to a close. Hopefully you've learned something today. Uh, please like, please subscribe, please leave a comment, and good luck with all your studies, and I will see you in the next video.